When I was in college in Mobile, we had a list of required courses that you had to take no matter what your major study was going to be. And so they, these included math, which was never my favorite. I actually took an extra science class to take one less math class. Um, but it also included taking classes like art history and a fine arts class. So you actually had to take a class to learn how to make some sort of art, painting, drawing, something like that. And the school I went to um, offered a photography class. And a lot of my classes were dictated by my work schedule. I worked while I was in college, and so I would tend to only take classes in the morning because I worked in the afternoon. But this photography class was an afternoon class, and I knew that's what I wanted to take, so I rearranged my work schedule a little bit so I could take this class. Now this was 2000 or 2001, long before everybody had a digital camera on their phone that could shoot HD video with the press of a button, which this one's doing right now. Um, so this class focused on film photography, particularly black and white film photography. So I borrowed my dad's camera, which I'm sure was made before I was born. Um, and enrolled in the class. Now, the class um, covered basics of taking photos, um, but what I was most excited about was that we were actually going to learn the process of developing film and making prints. And now this was tricky to learn. Like we could sit in the classroom and we could learn about the chemicals. You could learn how much of this powder you put into how much this water, what the temperature of the water was supposed to be. And then we would actually go into the dark room, but it, with the lights on, and they would show us the equipment and where the dials were. Um, but you didn't really actually learn how to do this until you went into these rooms with the lights off. And that's where it got a little hard, because moving around and doing kind of fine detail things in near darkness is not the easiest thing to do. So when the day finally came that we were going to go into the dark room with the lights off and make a print, I was really jazzed about it. Going into the dark room was kind of like going through a magical portal. It had one of these round sliding doors, so you were outside in the lab with the fluorescent lights on, and you stepped into this little chamber, and you had to move the door around, and it would close off the light behind you, and for a moment you were in complete darkness. And then you kept moving the door, and it would open up to this really kind of eerily red light that would be in the dark room because the the red light wouldn't uh, affect the chemicals in the paper the same way that white light did so that was the only light that you had in there and it would take a minute for your eyes to adjust and you would go over to this big machine and you'd have to put your negative strip into the enlarger and you would turn the switch on and Below you, you would see a reverse of the actual images. So what was light was dark, and what was dark was light. And you used this little thing that looked like a microscope that had a mirror on it to make sure that it was focused. And once you thought you had everything the way you wanted it, you had to turn the light back off and take out the special paper and put it under there and get your timer ready and then you hit the switch and counted the appropriate number of seconds and the light would expose the paper and then you would turn it off and the paper was still appeared to be blank because you then had to turn around and go through this whole chemical process and the really magic happened in the first tub of chemicals that you slid the paper in because that's when you got that moment of sliding that photo paper down under that water and shaking it and watching the image that was there but couldn't be seen suddenly slowly appear. And that's pretty exciting 
And at that point, you really want to see what's there, but you can't quite yet because you have to go through the rest of the process and putting it in a fixer and rinsing it off. And even at that point, you don't know what you have until you step back into that funny little portal and go back outside where there's real light and you can look down and see what hopefully is a photo that captured the beauty of the moment of the picture that you took. Today's gospel is sort of like a photograph, a snapshot of this amazing moment of Jesus's transfiguration. If you've been keeping track, we've been clicking along in the Gospel of Matthew, and today we're suddenly in Luke, and that's because the Feast of the Transfiguration is one of the few fixed feasts, is what we call them, meaning they happen on a set date on the calendar that actually takes precedence over a normal Sunday. So we kind of kick Matthew to the curb and jump over here to read about the Transfiguration in Luke because the feast of this is so important. This moment of transfiguration occurs in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but not John. John's always a little bit different. In all three of these gospels, the transfiguration comes about halfway through the story of Jesus. In all three of the Gospels, Jesus takes with him Peter, James, and John up to the mountain. In all three of the Gospels, Moses and Elijah appear. In all three of the Gospels, the transfiguration happens right after Jesus has foretold his death and resurrection. Now, when you see this image of this scene and you look at Moses, you're quick to see Moses maybe as the lawgiver. That's what we know him as. That's what we heard in Exodus, that he comes down with the tablets of the covenant and reads the commandments to the people. And when you see or hear the name of Elijah, you should be thinking Elijah, Israel's greatest prophet. But there's also a lot more going on. Because both Moses and Elijah are people that point to the coming of the Messiah. In Deuteronomy, Moses tells the people that in the end of days, the Lord will send to them a prophet like himself when they should listen to him. In Jewish tradition at the Seder, They keep a cup of wine in front of an empty chair at the end of the table waiting for Elijah to come to mark the beginning of the messianic age. All these people, Moses and Elijah, are not just about law giving and prophets, but they are there to mark and herald that Jesus is the one that had been promised. Imagine what it would have been like to be Peter, James, and John on this mountain, suddenly very outclassed by the company that they were keeping, tired from the journey up the mountain, certainly, most likely tired from all the journeys that they had been making with Jesus, probably overwhelmed by all that they had seen and heard and learned, maybe even still kind of reeling from the fact that Jesus had just told them that he would die but would be resurrected. And then here they found, find themselves on this mountain and are given this glimpse of God's glory made up in light and in the person of Moses and Elijah. Now, the disciples are never one to disappoint because even in this moment of wonder, the gospel tells us that their tiredness overcomes them. I kind of imagine them being like when you let little kids stay up late to watch a movie 
and they're sitting there on the couch looking at the screen and no matter how much they want to stay awake their eyes kind of start closing and their head will fall forward and they might wake up for a second and even if you say don't you want to don't you want to go to bed they're like no 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 I want to see the end of the movie and in this way, that's kind of what I imagine the disciples are like up there trying to stay awake because there's this wonderful thing happening, but becoming overcome with tiredness again and again. They are awake enough to see the vision of light and glory. And probably they think this is what we've been waiting for, right? We got Jesus. We got this holy moment on a mountain. We got Moses and Elijah here. And so Peter says, wait, wait, we shouldn't leave. Like, this is where we should stay. This is what we've been waiting for. And then the voice comes. This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. These words maybe seem familiar because similar words came from heaven at Jesus' baptism. And now before Jesus turns to Jerusalem, the voice comes again, and this time instead of addressing Jesus, addresses the disciples and commands them to listen to Jesus, to listen to his teachings and to follow him, no matter how confusing they may be because Jesus is the Son, the Chosen. And then the moment is gone, and it's just Jesus, and Peter, and James, and John. And Luke tells us that the disciples stay quiet. They don't tell anybody about what they have seen because they don't yet understand the full meaning of what has happened and would happen. Until the journey to Jerusalem is done, until the darkness of the cross gives way to the brightness of resurrection, the disciples can't understand what they've seen. Luke is the only gospel writer that gives us a hint of what Jesus and Moses and Elijah talk about in that moment. And the gospel writer tells us that they're talking about Jesus' departure. But the word here that we've brought forward in English as departure is the same word that means exodus. Moses, the lawgiver, the liberator that led the people of Israel in Exodus from slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land. Elijah, the great prophet whose coming that marks the Messiah, together they revealed that Jesus would lead the Exodus of all people from the slavery of sin and death to the freedom of grace and salvation. What I learned in that photography class some 16 years ago is that photography is all about capturing light. Snapping the photo is about seeing light and shadow, composition and contrast. And to reveal what has been created, you have to go into the dark to be able to see the light. And it is tricky, because in the dark, everything is reversed. What seems dark is light, and what is light is dark, and no matter, matter how amazing it is to see an image appear under the red light, you don't truly know what you are seeing until you step through complete darkness into real light. And the transfiguration we celebrate Jesus as the Messiah, the fulfillment of law and prophecy. And we learn in this moment that the glory of resurrection only comes by the darkness of the cross. And we are commanded to listen to the Son, to the Chosen. 
and we are called to offer our lives so that we ourselves can be formed and developed and transfigured into points of light in a world of shadow and darkness. Amen.